What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the LTC Bowling Show. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about me. Uh, I know it's not something I like to do a whole lot, but we're going to talk about where I came from, how I got into the sport, uh, and all that boring jazz, plus some future uh, plans that I may need some of your help with. Uh, so we're going to bring this all up here in a minute. Stay tuned. <laughs> All right, welcome back. So today, I kind of want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the dream. The, the, the dream of doing exactly what you feel like you're meant to do. And for me, it's always been involved with bowling. Uh, for everybody that's followed along, obviously I've been doing the coaching thing, the bowling thing, everything above uh, for a long, long time now. Um, I guess it hasn't really been that long. The coaching experience basically was started when I started working for Turbo. Uh, I did a little coaching before that, but not a lot. I didn't really get into it until I started working for Turbo. So it's only been about six years or so. Uh, and most people would say, well, wow, you, you know, that's, that's interesting. I would imagine you've been coaching for a lot longer. Well, to tell you the truth, I'm only 36. So, um, most people that I actually coach are older than me, which some people may find weird. Um, and, and we'll kind of get into the whole coaching conversation here in a minute. But um, where I came from, this is the story. This is how I even slightly became successful in this sport. I grew up in a small town up in Gaylord, Michigan. Uh, it's about three hours north of where I'm at now in the metro Detroit area. And uh, I played all the other sports. I played baseball, I played basketball, I played football. Uh, basketball was my passion at the time. I was really good at it, but um, I wasn't tall enough. I was, I mean, you know, I'm 5'11". I wasn't even 5'5 in high school. So uh, I didn't have the opportunity really to do anything with that. I wasn't going to be the next Muggsy Bogues or anything like that, being the short guy out there. Uh, so I actually, and, and I didn't even get to play basketball in high school because I um, I ended up hurting my back football season, freshman year football season, and it was right at the end of the season, right as basketball tryouts were starting. I went to tryouts, but I couldn't make it through. My back hurt way too bad, so I called it quits, and I just didn't do anything from there. Uh, a couple of months later, bowling was starting, um, and, and I bowled a little bit when I was a kid. You know, I was younger. I got started at about eight or nine years old. My stepdad at the time up in Gaylord, um, he was a bowler. Um, not the greatest bowler, but he liked to bowl. And, you know, I always saw his trophies and stuff around the house. And, and I thought it was interesting. So I'd go to the bowling alley with him every once in a while. And, you know, I'd hang out underneath the chairs and watch bowling. And sometimes I'd fall asleep under there, kind of like a typical kid, you know, but uh, I, I'd watch it and I kind of, it, it sparked my interest. So, um, you know, finally he signed me up for a youth league. Uh, and actually it was for a 4-H club is where I first started. I started bowling in a 4-H club, which I don't even know how that happened. I don't remember how it happened. But I just joined this club and they went bowling every week. And so I went and uh, I had this specific blue, I think it was an ebonite, an old ebonite ball, a blue one. Um, and it fit my hand. At least I thought it did at the time. And I would go and I'd grab that ball every week at the bowling center and I would bowl with it. And I specifically remember one day uh, where I got better and I bowled my first 200 game and I felt like I was invincible. I felt like I could do nothing wrong. And uh, I, I just, I kept at it from there. Uh, joined a youth league and, you know, kept bowling. Started, uh, I got my first uh, actual bowling ball, which was of my own, which would have been, uh, it was it was actually my stepdad's at the time. It was a 16 pound uh, black rhino. So one of the old original urethanes. Um, and I learned how to bowl with that, with a 16 pound ball when I was about 10 years old. So <laughs> I, I kind of had to learn fast and I had to build some arm strength and muscle fast. And maybe that's the trick to gaining wrist strength and muscle is, you know, using a, a weight that's too heavy for you. I don't know. They say, they, they recommend against that, of course, but, uh, I'm not really sure how that would work. But anyway, so I, uh, I started using this black rhino and, uh, I, I was always throwing it on the, you know, even when I couldn't bowl, I'd go to the locker room and I'd grab it and I'd be, you know, t we'd take alcohol to him at the time. And every single, you know, he bowled like two or three nights a week. I'd go to the bowling alley every single time with him and I would go into the locker and I would clean it. Now, even though I just cleaned it the night before and I didn't bowl at all, I'd take al alcohol to it and clean it up, you know, and I was that, I was that nerd constantly hanging out in the pro shop and asking questions and doing all this stuff. And, and, uh, I would be throwing the ball on the ground 
trying to practice my release, trying to learn how to curve it. Uh, and that's the way I learned, you know, I was all self-taught through this whole thing uh, because my stepdad didn't curve it. He just pretty much threw it straight uh, right up the tracker, right up 10, 11, 12, and he just threw it right at the pocket and, you know, he just tumbled it forward. He never curved it at all. Um, so he never taught me how to curve it. Um, I had to do it on my own. Uh, my stepbrother, you know, was, uh, you know, he, he was kind of bowling a little bit and he could curve the heck out of it. He could do a lot with it. And it was pretty cool. So I watched him and kind of put two and two together and figured it out. Eventually bowling in league, I started getting better and better and, and, uh, got through, you know, middle school. Uh, I kind of fell off a little bit, didn't bowl a ton in middle school. Um, but it was in high school when I finally decided, okay, well, I can't play basketball. Um, football hurt me, you know, so at this time I have to figure out what I'm going to do. So I started, uh, I played baseball in the springtime, so I was going to do bowling in the wintertime. Um, so I tried out for the high school team and I, I made it right away. Uh, granted, it wasn't very hard to make it because high school bowling wasn't huge back then. Um, but we, we had, you know, seven or eight, you know, guys on the team and, uh, we, we, we fielded a team and, uh, I got better and better, and eventually I started getting new bowling balls. Uh, I remember specifically having a speed zone. I had a combat zone. You know, I was into the Brunswick balls. I was into the the danger zones. You know, those I was into those bowling balls at that time. Um, and I remember before that, you know, going into the pro shop, um, which was in a different area at this time, uh, and seeing like the old hammer nail, um, you know, and some of those old, you know early early 90s bowling balls that were still sitting on the rack or on the on the wall um of course in the early 90s i was you know that's when i was you know in my teens um but uh so anyway i uh yeah started getting new bowling balls started getting better at the game um practicing a little bit and eventually i got to the point where i'm like all right well i'm doing i'm, I'm the highest league in the average and i'm the highest average in the league um traveling around the high school i was the highest average in high school and uh, most times, I, I think there was uh, one kid, uh, Casey Snyder from Alpena, who I battled, I battled with all the time, who we were, you know, constantly uh, back and forth. Um, and another kid from Alpena, I can't remember his name, though. Um, but he's, he's bowled some tour stops, not Casey, the other kid. I don't remember the kid's name, though. But he bowled some tour stops. I've seen him around here and there. Um, but anyway, so um, we... Uh, we battled in high school, man, and, and we never made it to states or anything because we just weren't that good as a team. I personally wasn't very good at that time. I mean, I was averaging like 210 or something, 20, 210, something like that, which at that time was pretty good. Um, but it wasn't good enough. I didn't ever do anything good in, in regionals or districts or anything like that. And uh, so anyway, so at the end of high school, I finally decided, you know, I, I got a passion for this thing. And the pro shop owner, he says, well, if you want to learn to be a bowler, then you should learn to run a pro shop. Um, so he hired me in to take over the pro shop up in Sheboygan, which was about a 45-minute drive up north uh, from from Gaylord even, up close to the, the UP. And uh, I started running the pro shop up there for a little while, uh, and then I started deciding I'm going to start taking some you know, some college classes to get prepped and and uh, and do all that stuff. Um, and so I... Uh, basically failed out of that college. I didn't do much at all. I, I only end up, ended up finishing one of the classes of the four that I signed up for because um, I just didn't want to do it. Like I just, it, I wasn't into it. I didn't really decide that I wanted to go to college until I started researching college bowling. Once I figured that out, you know, I'm seeing these guys, Bill O'Neill, Rob Pirashad, um, you know, Steve Novak, Anthony Lacaz, they're all, you know, over at, you know, SVSU. And I'm like, and they're the number one team in the nation, you know, battling with Wichita State. Uh, in Fresno State at the time, and I'm like, man, you know, that looks like fun. I watched the TV show the years before, and I'm seeing these guys out there, and I'm always watching the PBA shows and trying to, you know, watch. You know, one of the big per one of the big people that I watched the go growing up was Wes Malott. You know, his his release was one of the things that I really admired. I really liked the way he threw the ball. Him and Tommy Jones, you know, the guys that really hooked it. So that's kind of how I learned how to hook the ball. Is kind of watching some of these guys growing up, and. Uh, so anyway, so I decided I want to go to college, uh, and so I set up a tryout with Coach Dan Dorian down at Saginaw Valley. Um, it was at Little Zion Lanes. It was just this little, I think it was like a six-lane place, and inside a church, uh, Zion Church in Saginaw, or actually it was in Bay City. And uh, I went down there, took my buddy Josh with me, um, and he was going to try out too. Figured why not? He bowled, and you know he was technically you know as good or better than me at the time. But according to Dan Dorian, at that time. 
he wanted Josh to go to school and not me. So I just kind of gave it away a little bit. I went down there for the tryout. Dorian ripped me a new butthole. He told me how terrible I was. He told me that I um, would never make even his C team, let alone his A team. And that's just the kind of guy that Dan was. You know, he was a straight shooter. He's going to tell you how he feels. Uh, and maybe that's kind of where I got it from a little bit going into the bowling industry was just, you know, I, I saw it from him. Um, but he pretty much, he shot me down. He told me, don't even bother, more or less. And I was pissed. I was in tears. Uh, we drove back home. Uh, it was a good two-hour drive from Saginaw to Gaylord. We drove home. And uh, I, from that day forward, said, you know what? I'm going to prove him wrong. And so I spent the next, so I was, I was 17 at that time, I think. So I spent the next three or four years practicing every day you know you always hear people say well you know if I had bowling balls given to me or if I could practice all the time and practice for free I would you know I would get better too and I would get become a great bowler let me tell you what I paid for every single thing that I owned I did he give me discounts and stuff at the pro shop guy sure but I paid for every single bowling ball I bought bowling balls like they were going out of style I bought dozens of bowling balls over the course of a couple of years um, and I paid for practice and I was in there practicing by the hour almost every day I worked a job uh, delivering pizza and so when I wasn't working I was spending my money on bowling on tournaments and everything else every dollar I made basically went to that on top of paying for bills and stuff um, so any extra money I had went to bowling um, I, uh, so I practiced every single day working on my game. I bowled, every, this was when Brian Regan first started or was really up and coming doing his events and started doing the sport tournaments and stuff. And he was doing a lot of them up north, uh, and a lot of them down south. And I started bowling all of those. And eventually I started winning all of those. And uh, I had a good stretch of a couple of years where you know, there wasn't very many of them that I bowled that I didn't finish in the top three. You know, I, I, I won most of them. Um, and so, and that was when people were really first getting introduced to the idea of sport patterns, you know, so they, uh, they weren't, they, they, nobody really had an idea. So I developed my game based on that. I developed my game based on, you know, super flat patterns, have to keep your hand up the back of the ball and control it. And that's what I did. Um, I, I controlled the patterns and I kept it in play and I made spares and, you know, most times I came out on top, uh, and I got better and I got better and, I, uh, I bowled with a few of the guys that went to Saginaw Valley. Uh, one specifically was Steve Novak. Uh, he uh, he crossed with me or seen me bowl at a couple of events, and he eventually went to Dorian and was like, "Hey, you know this Jr. kid. You need to you need to bring him down here. He's he's pretty dang good." Um, and so, what do you know? Next thing you know, I'm getting a phone call from Dan Dorian a few years later, and uh, he says, "Hey, so I heard you've gotten a whole lot better at this game now." And, and every part of me wanted to, you know, just tell him off and tell him to piss off and I was going to go somewhere else. But I still had a passion to go to Saginaw. I still, I mean, it was just a few hours from my house. They were the number one school in the nation. They were winning. Like there's, I wanted to win. Like I wanted to be a part of a winning team. So I'm like, you know what? Sure. You know, I'll come down, uh, redo a tryout and whatnot. And, and I didn't even really try out. He, he basically threw a few shots and he basically kissed my butt and said you know we got Dan McClellan here and you know you and him will be our one-two punch you guys will you know run the show here and you guys will dominate and everything this and that and and he, boy he wasn't wrong <laughs> we uh I went down there and uh you know we bowled a, you know, a conference event first I didn't bowl very good um, but the first tier one we bowled in Milwaukee uh, I, I moved down. I lived with Steve uh, at his house. He bought a house in, on Lynn Street in Bay City. No longer has it. He lives in Kentucky now. But anyway, but I lived with him for a long time, actually. Um, and he uh, and we so we bowled our first tournament in Milwaukee at the uh, first Tier 1 event. And Dan and I finished 1-2. I won. Dan finished second. And from then on, it was in, – and Toby Seidel was on our team, too. I think he finished third or fourth. Um, so we had three of the top five spots on that first tier one, and we won that tournament 
leaps and bounds. It wasn't even close. Uh, and from there, the rest of the season, we ended up winning 18 out of the 23 events that we bowled. Uh, in, in the uh, in the other events, we either finished second or third. So we didn't, you know, in, in the other events that we finished second or third, the only reason we didn't win is because we drank too much the night before. We, it was college bowling back in my day was the way it's supposed to be. You know, I mean, I'm not advocating for drinking or anything like that, but boy, oh boy, we had fun. We had an awful lot of fun. Um, one specific story. I'll give you one story of what happened one year. Uh, I went bowled team trials. Uh, and it was that my freshman year, actually. I w- and we had a tournament in Cincinnati, I believe it was. But I went and bowled Team USA Trials. That was the year I finished fifth, I believe, um, and didn't make the team. Um, and I was mad. But they picked me up from the airport. I had my backpack and my bags and everything. Um, and we drank all that night. Like we, There were beer cans all over the room, everywhere in our, in our room. And uh, we got up next morning went for the tournament, got in the bus, uh, or the van at the time we were taking vans uh, we got in the van we drove to the bowling center got ready to go i have my bowling equipment and everything practice is about to start in about 10 minutes and i look and i don't have my backpack which has my bowling shoes and everything in it so i'm like hey dan uh we got a problem i don't have bowling shoes or anything and he's like oh you know he's like what were you guys doing drinking all night and you just forgot something and we kind of just chuckled it off and laughed and he uh he goes back to the room and grabs the shoes, and right as practice was starting, he comes in, so, you know, I, I get my shoes on, and start practice and stuff, and after practice, we group up, and he pulls us all to the side, and he says, you know, I absolutely expect you guys to win this by a lot, and we're kind of looking at him, and we're like, well, we, we always do, like, we were cocky, you know, we we're like, we always do, what's going to be the difference here, he's like, and you know how I know you're going to, I walked into that room, and there were beer cans everywhere <laughs> we just bust out laughing We're like yeah we had a pretty good night <laughs> it was a good time <laughs> so that was that and we did we ended up winning that tournament um and it was i mean college bowling was a blast um but basically so from then on uh we dominated through there and that's when i eventually uh that year i made a dumb decision but a smart decision it was a good decision but a bad decision at the same time i chased a girl <laughs> and met a girl named tina who went to McKendree University at the time, uh, and she was, we talked, and, you know, I started driving back and forth there, it was a good nine-hour drive, uh, and I did it, you know, at least three times a month, um, driving back and forth from Saginaw down there um, to hang out with her, and eventually she talked me into transferring down there, and uh, I talked to Gary White at the time, he was the head coach, and handled all the school, and, and at this time, nobody knew who McKendry was, uh, they were just a podunk school down in BFE, Illinois, uh, and we, uh, I talked to Gary and he kind of gave me free reign. You know, he was like, Hey, help me build this thing. Let's, let's put something together and build a guy's team and see how far we can take this thing. So I was like, all right, well, I'll, you know, I'll do what I can. I'll, and that, this is, you know, when I really started coaching and really paying attention to other people, this is what started it other than Saginaw. Obviously I paid attention and helped the guys at Saginaw as well. Um, but this was major, major difference for me because now I'm taking a group of guys who weren't quite as experienced and were wanting to learn and wanting to get better um, and tried to help as much as I could. Uh, and at times I was probably a little rough, a little hard. Um, we got some spats and gotten some arguments, especially with Dan Struble. I tell you what, Dan Struble, love the guy to death. He's the coolest kid I know. Uh, but man, he was he was a hard head. He was hard to deal with, but he was hilarious. I loved hanging out with Dan. Uh, so Dan, if you're hearing this, I hate you, but I love you. <laughs> but um, we, we had some good times and we had some hard times. But we eventually, we uh, Gary's like, all right, we got to get a new coach in here. Because at the time, Steve Boxerman was in there. He wasn't really much of a coach, you know, and he didn't put... He was more working more than he could, you know, handle the team and whatnot. He was just a part-time guy, you know. So we're like, all right, let's try to get somebody in there. So Gary put together a couple of interviews and stuff. And uh, and he had asked me my opinion on it. And I talked to a few of the guys, including Dennis Knepper. Uh, and that's when Gary and I got together. And I said, you got to bring Dennis in here. Like, Dennis is the most knowledgeable. You know, he was easy to talk to. He was cool, easy to get along with. Uh, I think he'll help. You know, I think he'll do a pretty good job. Uh, and, and, you know, and I'll help him as much as I can. And so Gary's like, okay, let's let's bring Dennis in here then. So he hired Dennis and brought him in there. And uh, that's kind of when it blew up. That's when it started to roll. And uh, we started getting the guys on the right page. Um, we didn't make nationals the first year, but the, my second year there, uh, we were close the first year, but the second year there we made nationals and we started to gain some steam. Uh, and eventually... Um, 
the third year, um, we ended up recruiting A.J. Johnson. Um, and he came down to practice with us. And, you know, I talked to A.J. a little bit when he was younger. And um, I'd like to think that I was, you know, one of the helping hands that ended up getting him to come down to McKendree uh, and, and go to school there, and which he did. Uh, he actually ended up coming the year I left. Uh, he came down. And um, I basically handed the reins over to him and said, hey, we got you going in the right direction. Now you take it the rest of the way. And they did. Dennis took that team uh, and built a national championship powerhouse down there. Um, and then they brought in Shannon and Brian O'Keefe. And, they, uh, and they've obviously done some great things, both with the women's and the men's team. Gary White did a good job with the women's team. Uh, he had them in the national championship match on TV in 2006 when I was at Saginaw Valley, um, which, by the way, that's how I met the girl. So, um, And so they did a good job down there, and they're still doing a good job. Shannon's doing a great job with the girls uh, and the guys down there. Dennis obviously doing, always doing a good job with the guys. Guys have national championships under their belt. Uh, the girls obviously have national championships, both you know NAIA and NCAA because they're an NCAA school now. Um, so they've done a heck of a job down there. Um, and at that time, uh, I ended up leaving McKendree and started kind of chasing around the regionals and bowling a little bit more um, and ended up moving back to Saginaw. Um, and uh, at that time is when I met a kid, uh, Jordan Vanover, who was – he had a pretty good reputation in the area. He owned a pro shop and stuff and kind of helped me out a little bit, uh, redid my fit and all that. That's when I started to see a little bit of success. Um, bowling a lot of the regional stuff and he backed me a little bit and paid for stuff and we made some money in Regan's events and that um, and then there was one conversation I had with him uh, and this was prior to the year 2014 uh, where he was basically telling me and I don't even know where it came from but he basically told me that I would never see success uh, at any level of the PBA uh, if I kept my swing the way it was because I had that loop at the top and it pissed me off and I'm like oh who the hell is this kid? Like, this kid's awful himself, you know? And I'm thinking this because that's just a natural reaction. You're, like, trying to defend yourself. You know, I didn't say anything to him. I'm just like, mm, I don't agree, but we'll see, you know, because nobody was going to work harder than me. I practiced, you know, the, the, what I went through to even get to the level that I was at before, uh, it was like, it's like, you don't have no idea how much work I put in to get to this level. You have no idea how much work I'm going to get put in to get myself on TV, you know? So... Um, that was just another kick in the butt, and eventually I did. Uh, it was probably the next year or the year, a year and a half out later. I think it was in 2013 is when we had this conversation. And uh, that next year, you know, he ended up going to work for Turbo. Um, that yeah, it was yeah in 2014 he went to go work for Turbo or whatever, maybe 14 or 15 I think. And uh, I ended up making TV show out there, making all kinds of cuts. And then the very next year after that is when I made a few more shows. Um, and you know, it was kind of great until I got the job offer at Turbo. <laughs> Once I got the job offer at Turbo, um, that's when it was kind of like, and Jordan actually was the one that recommended me to Chris San. And uh, Chris San ended up hiring me, uh, and I worked there from 2016 until, you know, the end of, uh, middle of 2019, so three and a half years, uh, almost four years. And, uh, I mean, nobody really knows the story of why I left there. I don't think few people do, but nothing, nothing major, just disagreement. Um, but anyway, but yeah, so I was, so I made those shows, did all that. And, um, that's when I kind of gained the love of coaching and everything is when I was at Turbo. Uh, and that's when I left there and started thinking like, you know what, I can do something more with this. And I made, while I was at Turbo, I made the YouTube channel and I'm like, I just want to help bowlers. Like there's gotta be something I can do here where I can somehow help people to get them to be better bowlers and I did and I made that YouTube channel and it blew up pretty quick uh, within a month I had enough subscribers to you know do you know to start the whole monetization and stuff and get to really spread out and start doing some things there and uh, it got to about 10,000 subscribers within a few months and I just kept doing those videos and that's when the ultimatum came up either you get rid of the YouTube channel or you don't work here anymore and I'm like hmm, okay See you later. So <laughs> I, I seen the growth with YouTube and I, I knew what I could do with it. And obviously you can see it's still growing. It's up to almost 43,000 subscribers now. Um, and it, it's just, it's, it's been a, it's been a, a blessing that people are willing to watch and, and, and learn as much as they can. Um, and so that's when I started working and I'm like, I'm going to take this avenue, 
that I have. Obviously, I have a pretty good following with this, and I'm going to help another company. I'm going to give the opportunity to a couple of companies, and I'm going to and I'm going to say, look, I'm going to you know basically I'm going to have you sponsor my channel, and I'm going to promote your site, and we're going to build this thing right. And that's when Bowler X came into play, and you know he's like, you know what, it's a good idea, but I got a better idea. I'm going to have you build our our web, our YouTube. All right, well that's a good idea because now we're building two separate YouTube channels where I can do, you know, sometimes you see the same type of uh, stuff on both channels, but most times it's a lot of training on mine and then ball reviews and product reviews and a little bit of training on the Bowler X channel. Uh, and we've grown that channel from 2,000 subscribers to 18,000 subscribers in a year. Uh, so it's grown pretty quick as well. Um, so we're getting to do some good things there. So now the next step is a training center. Um, now I want to be able to take and use everything that I have to build uh, a private training center um, to where it can be specifically for you know uh, all the videos for all of the the research kind of like a I, I don't want to say I, I'm gonna tell you the CTD thing creating the difference there Mr. Ron Hicklin that was my idea he stole it. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I mean, it was, I mean, that we, we've talked, him and I both have talked back and forth. And I kind of told him, I'm like, look, I'm trying to build a training center. This is what I want to do. Uh, I want to be able to help as many people as I can. And obviously, you know, it's, you know, it's a job, you know, it's, 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 it's my dream job basically. And that's what it was at Turbo. The problem with Turbo was it wasn't geared towards training. Like, even though they call themselves a training center, uh, that's their last they don't really care too much about. I hate to say they don't care about it, but that's their last priority when it comes to the, that that company. It's more about their products. It's about selling their products. Um, so having somebody in there doing constant training wasn't their thing then, um, and now they have Andrew in there. I don't know how much training they're doing over there or how many lessons they're doing over there, but I know when I left, we were pretty packed. We were slammed in there, uh, and people were paying a pretty penny to go in there. So... Um, that's when I kind of gained the whole thing. Like, what if I actually had a building that was just like Turbo in a way, you know, but was a pro shop? It was a training center with some, you know, exercise facility and some other like meeting rooms and for clinics and classes and stuff uh, in, you know, where I could host, you know, parties and banquets and, you know, small things like that in there as well and do some other oddball things in there. So it could have a, a revenue stream outside of just training center and pro shop. You know, so I built up this whole business proposal, this plan, this whole idea. Problem is, I don't have the money to do it. <laughs> so I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to develop the entire, the whole entire thing, saving money, doing all that stuff. Uh, I could probably go take out a business loan or at least try to. I don't know how easy they are to come by right now, um, but I'm, t I'm looking at, you know, probably sixty-five thousand to get it done properly and that's if i lease up space that's not buying something that's just leasing a building that's already there and then kind of building into it and and turning it into what i want to and then eventually moving out into a space that we buy um but trying to basically uh get on board and kind of you know make a an ltc ltc bowling training center and uh now that's kind of where you guys come in this is kind of where my idea is going on this is my ability to be able to to do as much training as I can. I mean, the amount of people I've had, you know, fly over to see me and stay multiple days to come train with me, has been kind of mind blowing. Um, just being at Classic Lanes over there in Rochester Hills, like we've done, I've done quite a few lessons over there, uh, with the exception of COVID, obviously. But that's would have been nice if I had a training center during COVID. I could have still been doing, you know, technically they say I, I couldn't have, but you know, private facility like that, only having two people in the building it wouldn't have been a problem. You know, it's not like it's open to the, it wouldn't have been open to the public. I would have kept it closed to the public, uh, except for a by appointment. You know what I'm saying? So if I had a private facility like that, none of this matters. Like none of this stuff would matter. I could, you know, take phone calls and have people coming in for meetings and training and everything else anytime, uh, that I wanted in the middle of the night, even, you know, it wouldn't matter. Somebody come from Australia on the other side of the country or on the other side of the, the world. Um, we could meet in the you know middle of the night wouldn't wouldn't matter but anyway so the point is this is where you guys come in so i'm going to put a link at patreon and what i'm going to do is for every dollar from here on out that comes through patreon uh, or any of the donate if you do it at anchor you can do it at anchor.fm and you can support the podcast there 
for every dollar that comes in through there, it's going towards a training center. We're putting it into this training center. So basically, we're accepting donations to get this thing going. To get a training center going up in the Midwest, in the Northeast, Midwest, uh, we're going to get this get this shindig started. Um, because we're going to put, you know, my idea would be to have four lanes in there, two on each side of the building. And then through the middle of it would be retail and meeting rooms and all that good jazz uh, to be able to host parties and all that stuff. But that's what we're going to do. I'm going to put the Patreon link up here. I know it still says lessons and stuff on there, but donate whatever you can. If you if you can get on there and you can, you know, basically sponsor uh, the page for whatever it is that you are willing to do. Uh, if you feel like this would be a good idea, something that would be great, anybody in the metro Detroit area, probably a great idea. Uh, I'll, I'm going to get some people involved to, uh, to come help run the place too. Um, maybe I can even get Mason to get out of the whole diesel thing or even maybe we'll build up a, a training center that has a garage in it. So that way he can do the mechanic work. And while you wait, getting your mechanic stuff done, you can come inside and bowl, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. We're going to do some things, but I've got a business plan and at least I've got the building set up um, how I would want it. I've done all the layouts, the blueprints and everything, how I would want to do it. Um, now I just need the finances to make it happen. So anybody that wants to help make this happen, or if you know a financial guy that wants to come in and come in on business with this thing, I would be more than happy to have a conversation with you uh, and and see if we can't strike a deal. But everybody else, you know, let's. Uh, I'm going to start rolling some some donations into Patreon, some support in there, and we're going to put it towards getting this training center built as quickly as possible. Um, but that's all I got for you today. Kind of want to just let you know what I'm planning, what how where I came from, uh, and everything that went on uh, through my life getting into bowling and how I've gotten to where I'm at. You know, so with the help of everybody here. Um, hopefully we can build a training center and get all this to grow a little bit more, um, and be able to help a lot more bowlers get that much better. So, um, as you know, there's not really a whole lot of money in, in YouTube and the monetization and all that, um, podcasts don't make money unless there's sponsors there, you know, so, um, it's all basically on support from you know the help of friends and people who want to see us be successful so if you want to see me be, be successful and build this training center for you guys to get you guys to come up here maybe i'll even make a deal maybe i'll make it to where anybody that donates in there you know you get a free day to come in there and do whatever you want you know practice and whatever else you know just show that you donated when you come in and you know you'll be able to do you know whatever you want in there practice for a little while and wander around whatever it may be you know, buy you a beer or something, buy you a soda, whatever it may be. So anyway, I'm out of here, guys. We'll see you guys later. Take care for the next episode of uh, Life's Traction Control. I guess it would just be the LTC Bowling Show. Thanks. <laughs>